We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and welcome back to part three of our F1 team genealogy series, in which we are talking about the history of F1 teams that we know and love and how they became the teams that we are living with today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes, Yes. this is this is part of our F101 series, but we're doing a special little mini series, if you will, on team genealogy. Like Catherine said, we are on part three. So if you missed parts one and part two, make sure you check them out. We're covering two teams, an episode, five episodes in total, so that we can cover every team that is currently on the grid and kind of trace back to where they came from. So very interesting. Yeah. yeah you and know, I'm really we've... excited about today's episode because it's the first time we actually have like true new teams, new re- like re- it's not just one team, right? Because the first four teams we did, just to kind of start off the series, we did teams that have always been one team. Maybe they're newer, like Haas, but it's always been Haas. So today we are covering Steak, Sauber, whichever you prefer to call them. They don't know yeah. themselves and V carb. So this is the first time we actually get changing of hands and big changes in names as well. Yeah, no, we 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 go through a lot of name change like steak steak sauber whatever you want to call them soon to be Audi. They've always been kind of, you know, technically they they were bought out by, you know, a Swiss financial firm halfway through their existence to what we know now, but technically they've always been sauber, but they've just I don't they, buy it. <laughs> I have I have in our rundown um steak parentheses rebound uh rebrand central because they've changed they they've changed names a number of times, which kind of really explains why like the likes of like Martin Brundle and Ted Kravitz from Sky Sports always just call them Sauber because it's so hard to keep track of what they're actually called week to week, especially now because steak F1 kicks sauber, depending on what country they're racing in and what country's gambling laws say they're known as stake or kick technically so they just say screw it and call them sauber this is the dumbest thing they could have done like it's right. so dumb and i know everyone just calls them sauber but like that's not even really what their name is like it's stake f1 kick sauber so that's like towards the end of it right And like, because you have to put all the sponsors first, right? But like one weekend, they're one one weekend, they're the next, like, this is the dumbest thing for brand, like, to be noticed as a brand ever. It's not like McDonald's is not McDonald's in random countries. You know what I mean? Like, it's stupid. Yeah, no, this episode is really like the teams with like the two current stupidest names because Visa Cash App RB is also not really a winner, though I think you and I are on the same page that Stakes team name, Sauber's current team name is kind of worse than Well, it's also because we can like come up with such funny nicknames for V-Carb. Like I refuse to call them V-Carb. They are Red Bull Junior and they will always be Red Bull Junior to me. We will get to that when we cover (laughs) V-Carb. Also, whoever decided the acronym was going to be V-Carb, it's so dumb. Like, I think you could have called them, like, Visa. Like, I don't understand. I mean, then Cash App doesn't get its notoriety, whatever. Right. But, but like, just Visa, I don't know. Whatever. It's stupid. Well, and the the other part of that is... But the, the other part that I have a problem with is, like, technically their name is not even, like, Racing Bulls, you know, Red Bull Jr., you know, whatever. It's just RB. RB. Like, that's, like, that's just what it is. Like, if you look it up, the team is just the RB team, and Visa Cash App are its sponsors. So it, it's not like you can even call them, like, the Racing Bulls or whatever, which would be, like, kind of within the realm of, like... I mean, we'll get there, but Toro Rosso was literally just Red Bull in Italian. Right. If it was racing bulls, like, then we wouldn't have to be like, V-carb. It'd be like, oh, the racing bulls. Like, that's at least 
not yeah. dumb. But anyway, so. we'll get there in a minute. <laughs> First, we're going to talk about Steak slash Sauber. They've been around, a, they were they were actually around a, a while, a lot longer before they actually became an F1 team. They started as Sauber Motorsport in the 70s and then didn't get to, you know, they, they were in the kind of racing through the ranks for a few years before they actually made it to Formula One in 1993. And I think it's interesting uh, that their first appearance on the F1 grid was the 1993 South African Grand Prix that is a Grand Prix we don't have right now and today as I was you know scrolling through Instagram Lewis Hamilton is going back on his kind of annual reminder that Formula One needs to go back to Africa um, and and race somewhere in in Africa Um, and so I just I thought that it was interesting and very timely and one of the you know parts to this series is looking at the races that teams do not and probably will not ever race at and maybe we'll get a south african grand prix oh bishop's dinner time maybe we'll go we'll go back to south africa eventually but at the moment formula one is not really seriously looking in africa as much as i can see no and on, i mean i know this is getting on a tangent but i feel like lewis hamilton is one of those guys who's super like dedicated to this and he will not quit until we're racing in africa Oh, probably not. I would love to see it again. I mean, it's not like it's never happened. Clearly, you know, they have it on the calendar before. um, And I'd love to see it back. Yeah, I I do know that right now the South Africa, the the track, the circuit itself is not currently rated for Formula One races. And it would need some added infrastructure um, and, you know, money to make it something that would be viable for the calendar and would make it, you know, like an F1 caliber track, which it is not right now. And that's one of the big stumbling blocks uh, to going back to Africa to have a race at some point yeah. eventually. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. It would be really cool if they did. Um, okay. So to be honest with you all, I could care less about Sauber now than we notice <laughs> at all points in time, but it's interesting, like just in the team genealogy to see like the drivers and like who has touched this team Because if you think about it, like, this is where people have gotten their start. But today, it's, like, absolutely zero people actually want to drive for this team. So one that I also, I forget where he's driven because he's driven for so many places. But Kimi Raikkonen, Mm -hmm. he drove for, like, the OG Sauber team. Yeah, and and to to make a point with you saying OG, there have there were kind of two Sauber eras within this you know long standing history of this team from from ninety three to where we are now. So we have the original Sauber era, which Raikkonen did drive for, and then he also drove for the Alfa Romeo era, which we'll talk about later. Yeah, but like just looking at it, he's probably the most notable, recognizable name. Yeah, that he, has, he's that and, for them in the beginning. Yeah, and he was also part of the best season that they had in 2001. They finished P4, which is wild because they only had 21 points and really goes to show know, the changes. I know, I was thinking that, like, that, how are you P4 with 21 points? Yeah, because, like, the, the top two teams that year, I don't remember which one they were when I was doing the research, but, like, they had, like, a, like at least 100 points, and then, like, the drop-off from, you know, P3 <laughs> to P4 was as significant as, as our drop-off between, like, P4, P5 that in the 2024 championship. But, yeah, Raikkonen and Nick Heidfeld, they put together the best season, you know, P4, and that's really all that we kind of have to say for the original era of Sauber. You know, we we had a few drivers of note, Johnny Herbert, John Alacy, Felipe Massa, Jacques Villeneuve, but they didn't really do much to start. And it wasn't until they kind of moved into their BMW era, which lasted from 2006, 2010, where they were kind of better. Yeah. And I always forget because it was so long ago, even though it doesn't feel like it was that long ago. I forget that BMW was with Sauber when they were on the F, like when they were a team. Cause right. I, I just like don't put two and two together that it was BMW and Sauber. I don't know why, but yeah. it's always like, oh yeah, BMW is on, like took over the team. I think it's just sneaky. Like Sauber's always been around, but they've been like a sneaky 
partner. Yeah, and I mean, the and the BMW era didn't last long. It was only right. it was really what four years, six, four seven, seasons. eight, nine, ten, five, five seasons. Well, okay, so technically it was five seasons, two thousand six to two thousand ten, but technically for real it was only 06 to 09 uh what happened was in 2010 or after the 2009 season which was not a good season their best season was 2007 where they actually finished p2 in the championship but after 2009 bmw decided to leave formula one and when they did peter sauber who was the founder of, of sauber wanted to change the name back but because there was an issue with the concord agreement they were forced to remain bmw sauber in 2010 even though bmw didn't have any actual involvement i'm just gonna pause right there that is the most like sauber team thing to ever happen yeah the like that sauber just, bureaucratic fits. But also, like, very Formula One to be so, like, to have such a bureaucratic oh, yeah. constraint of, like, no, you can't change your name even though they're leaving. You still have to to be that thing. Oh, my God. That is so funny. And, like, of course it happened to Sauber. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so you, like you mentioned, their best season was 2007, but they got their first win in 2008. The, uh, Robert Kubiak got it at the Canadian Kubica. Grand Prix. Kubica. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, I know. Oh, it's Polish. Kubiak, Kubiak is a America is an ex-American football player. <laughs> That's I, why. I love Robert Kubica's story because like this was his only F1 win. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but this is only F1 win. And then a couple years later, going into the 2011 season, he was doing some rallying and crashed really bad, um, got in this awful accident, um, had part of his arm amputated. And then eventually he came back to Formula One. Like a couple years later, he drove for Williams for a full season. Didn't do very well, but he drove for them. Like he came back to Formula One. He still races and, and does rallying now. But yeah, he, you know, what one of those like major crash survivors and he figured out how to drive with, you know, whatever had they had to do to put his arm back together. That's insane. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, now that I know how to pronounce his name. Um, yeah. So it's he Polish. Did... <laughs> Um, so he did get this team's first win. So if you have been listening, and oh, oh, thank you, and only. So if you've been paying attention or listening to part one and part two, we've done this like first win for the team. What F one race is that in like in total? So this was Sauber's forty second Grand Prix and F one's seven hundred and ninety second, which yeah. like. F1's been around for a long time, yada, 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 whatever. But that's just crazy when you think of, like, Ferrari when they had their first win and it was the 12th F1 win. Yeah. <laughs> so crazy. So yeah. crazy. But anyways, so first and only. And yeah, for, it will probably and, be that way for a while. <laughs> well, well, it, it will be kind of forever because, you know, once Sauber leaves and we have Audi, Audi take over in 2026, then we will close the book in it. And I don't think there's going to be much of a chance of Stake winning a race between now and the middle of the 2024 season fall break and the end of 2025. Unless something yeah, really, just really like weird as happens. as a team in general, like we'll, we'll still, we'll have to beef it up next or in two seasons when yeah. Audi takes over but um yeah I don't know this is just yeah rough, another rough thing seas. to note about Sauber Steak whatever the hell they're called is they also had a female team principal for a, a point in time they had Manisha Cattleborn um who um was Austrian but she was born in India and she was a team principal in the BMW era starting in 2010 and then ended up staying through the second Sauber era until 2017 and that was kind of after Sauber sold to Longo uh, Longo Finance which is the the company that owns it today um, until Audi in, until Audi comes in, that um, so she she was the team principal as a female, which we don't see a lot of. And you know, the last one that we've talked about was of course Claire Williams from the Williams family. Um, yeah, she she ran the team um, from 2010 until 2017. So she started in the kind of like no man's land era where BMW was their team, but it wasn't their team, right? And then moving into that second sour era, like we were talking about, and that era spanned from 2011 
to 2018. Right. So right to, to as basically as soon as they changed hands, I guess uh, Longbow and Cataborn did not want to go in the same direction. So they got rid of her and brought on Fred Vasseur, who we all know and love as Ferrari's current team principal. Yes, we love him. So in this second Sauber era, before they become Alfa Romeo, there are some like very notable people who drove for the second Sauber. coming of Sauber. <laughs> <Which> are, <laughs> I guess we're on like the third coming of Sauber now, but the second coming of Sauber. So you have like Checo Perez. Kamui, Kamui Kobayashi. Yes. Okay. I just, I will never be good at pronouncing names. Um, so those are, and like, like you said too, Fred Vassour, obviously not a driver, but a team principal. So very notable. We know who they are. Um, and it should be to no one's surprise that Checo holds like some of their best finishes and was part of the 2012 season where they ended up at P6, which was one of like the, or it was, the it best was their best they had. Yeah. So, and he, Which doesn't he did, mean much, but it, <laughs> he it got was their close best. to adding some more wins, though. He did finish P2 in a handful of races and P3, and so did uh, Kobayashi, but they did not get a win during that time. Yeah, and they mostly spent their time in the basement where they are now. Um, they had, you know, three P10 finishes in 14, 16, and 17. So not so great. Kobayashi, if you don't know, is kind of like the best Japanese Formula One racer you know, in the history of Japanese Formula One racers, there there are not a lot that have done a great amount, and he's kind of one of the most notable. And I think he's the longest serving. Uh, and I, uh, you know, probably Yuki Sonoda now would be, you know, he's coming, come, come, words, Catherine, coming for that mantle. But he is the last Japanese driver to uh, finish on the podium. That's fair. I still Yuki will always be number one in my heart. But well, of course, it's fair um, to say that he's on his way, on the up and up. Yeah, and then other drivers of note, we've got Antonio Giovinazzi, also known as Italian Jesus. He's kind of been been in a reserve driver uh, form for a while. He was on the Ferrari Le Mans team that won 24 hours um, a couple years ago. Pascal Verline, who did not do great in Formula One, but is tearing it up in Formula E. And of course, Charles Leclerc made his Formula One debut at Sauber. Yeah. Which I we all forget, forget because he was there. He was there for like five minutes and then immediately left for Ferrari. Yeah. Well, good for him. Okay. That closes out the second coming of Sauber. And we, of course, then move into the Alfa Romeo era. So this is up until last season, we were Alfa Romeo. So it's 2019 to 2023. Not a ton of like notable drivers during this period. No, Charles not really. Leclerc, I think was there for like a season with no, Alfa Romeo. No, he, he never drove with Alfa Romeo. He, Did he, he was not? with Ferrari by, the, t- by that time. That. Yeah. Well. The, the, the one interesting thing is like we think of Alfa Romeo or – if you're newer to Formula One, you think of Alfa Romeo as that really mediocre team at the bottom of the grid that was like where Kimi Raikkonen's career ended. Right. But Alfa Romeo was one of the original Formula One teams. And they, you know, they were an engine manufacturer and a constructor for decades. And this Alfa Romeo that we have here is still sauber. So it doesn't have the same connection to like that you know, early original era, but they were the title sponsor of a car that was technically, you know, it's a Ferrari car. And, you know, Alfa Romeo is a, is a Ferrari constructor and is currently a Ferrari constructor. Yes. Are you sure Charles Leclerc didn't drive for them? I'm checking again. (laughs) I am so convinced (laughs) that he did. I'm looking looking oh no you are right and i am yes. wrong <laughs> yes Everyone, yes we are not cutting was... this out Emily's no right. we're not Catherine getting this out. wrong this is the first time <laughs> I think this has ever happened in the history of the podcast oh I'm probably so right. not but yes um yes so he was there for two seasons i lied it was two seasons um and then he went off to bigger dreams at ferrari where he continues to be ferrari's you know the second coming of jesus christ at ferrari yeah but, you know, current drivers are Joe and Valtteri Botas. Yes. Um, I think Joe is super notable, especially his fashion. Um, I also think he's such a great driver to have on the grid. I will be First Chinese driver in Formula One history. 
Yeah, that's pretty incredible, pretty noteworthy. I think he's so great for the sport, and I'm really sad that we're not going to see him next season. But hopefully he'll yeah. come back. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, we still, as as of recording, we do not know who is going to be in that second stake seat in 2025. It's probably not going to be Zhou Guan Yu, uh, but it's probably going to be Valtteri Botas or Gabriel Bortoletto. Yeah. Well, we just don't know who it is yet. We don't. Uh, but yeah, so currently, because they were they were the tail end of the Alfa Romeo era, and now currently in this season, they are the Stake F1 team kick sauber. Yeah. Cool. Good the car's for bad. you. The car sucks, but you can't miss it. It's lime green. Yep. <laughs> Big green machine. And it is still Joe and Valtteri. And they will usher in, well, who knows, but the future. So next season, they'll be Sauber? Not next, uh, two, two, yeah, next season, they'll still be Stake. And then in 2020... I thought they were dropping the Stake next season, though. So it's I don't just think Sauber. they are. I don't Maybe think they are. Maybe I'm getting confused are. because, like, Kravitz, Ted Kravitz, like, only calls them Sauber. Well, because they only call them Sauber. No, I think they're, sure. they're staying Stake. As far as I know, they're staying Stake, Kick, whatever, until the end of 2025. And then they will become... Audi, Audi when Audi takes over the team and so far the only driver that we know for 25 26 is Nico Hulkenberg who is currently at Haas right which so makes sense German car German driver. German team German driver yeah love but yeah so that is it for what will be Audi what is currently who knows what their name is Sauber. But basically Sauber, a team that had very mediocre beginnings, a flash in the pan moment of decency. That's being generous. <laughs> they had two seasons where they finished P2 and P3 in the championship, and that's kind of all there is. And now they are a team that is at risk of scoring no points this season. Not Yikes. At risk. I think it's pretty confirmed. They're not scoring a point. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's it's going to be, in, unless they come out with some, like, miracle upgrades and, like, Botas manages a P10, I don't think they're getting on the board this year, which, as we know, is not common, but not uncommon, as, you know, Haas has done it at least once. Fair, fair. Yeah. All right. So, moving from irrelevance to maybe a little bit more relevance, we have V-Carb. So, full name, Visa Cash App RB, which... Yep we earlier discussed is dumb and stupid, but they've obviously not always been called that. So they originated as Minardi. Yes. And Minardi was on the Formula One grid for a lot of years. They got their, their first start was in 1985 and their last season on the grid was like 2006 or 2005 because Toro Rosso took over in 2006 and they didn't have a lot of success. Their best finish was P4 um, in the, uh, is it in the champion? Where are my notes? No, th their best finish on the grid was P4. Uh, they, the, and their best season was only P7. So they were never great, but they had a kind of a cult following of popularity because they lasted so long. And a lot of really notable drivers drove for Minardi. Yeah. None that we probably are like big fans of today. I um, mean, one or one. Okay, well, you can you can take this away because I'm going to butcher the pronunciation for okay. usual. Well, you're not going to butcher Fernando Alonso's pronunciation of his <laughs> name because Fernando Alonso, who has been driving forever, and this is our, you can, if you're, you've got your bingo cards ticking Check. off that we have aged Fernando Alonso as he has, you know, been on the grid forever. But yeah, we have Fernando Alonso. We have Mark Weber, who is a former actual Red Bull driver and also is currently Oscar Piastri's driver manager. And he was kind of the guy who was responsible for getting Piastri out of Alpine. And of course, we will talk about Alpine uh, in part five, part five. But yeah, Mark Weber is kind of known for for saving Oscar Piastri from his current fate at uh, or at what would have been his fate at, at Alpine, which is not very good. And then of course we have, well, I'm going to save one for last, but we've got uh, Giancarlo Fisichella and Yarno Truly are a couple other notable names. And then I think one of the more notable names now is uh, former Minardi driver and parent of current Formula One driver, Jos Verstappen. Yeah, that's that right. guy. Yeah, that man. Um, he, I think it's really interesting. Although it's not like technically the same team, it is the same 
team. I mean, it was know, bought and became the same team. Right. It turned into a team that his son then drove for. So I think it's really right. interesting that although it's not like father, son, both driving for minority, it's the father, son driving for the same ish team that was bought and sold. Yeah, exactly. So Giancarlo Minardi sold the team to Paul Stoddart in 2001 to save the team from folding financially because apparently it's very expensive to run a Formula One team. I don't Allegedly. know if you were aware of that. <laughs> Allegedly. And then Stoddart was the guy who sold the team to Red Bull in 2005, which turned it into Toro Rosso, a.k.a. the Red Bull Junior team. Yeah, so... Love the name Toro Rosso. I don't know why we ever got rid of it. Like, I do. I understand. Catherine, you can tell me for the hundredth time, and I still am not going to agree. <laughs> but it's, like, so good because this team is the Red Bull Junior team. Toro Rosso means Red Bull in Italian. This yeah. team was based in Italy. Like, it just all made sense, and it's, like, such a good branding. I just – I love it. And, you know, the – mind behind Red Bull and so many things that this the team did great um Deertrick who did pass away last a season, couple of years think, ago two, two seasons, seasons ago um he was like the brainchild behind Red Bull and he also helped found this team and I'm not even going to attempt his let Matt Matt Mattishitz Mattishitz thank you um yeah but he um, was like the brain brainchild behind this, which he, he did so many good things for both teams. Yeah, and now everybody is just mad that they weren't the first, you know, team to figure out like, oh, hey, we could have a second team on the grid if we call it a junior team. And yeah. now we have like the likes of McLaren who are like, this is not good. We don't like it. And people need to investigate. And they just always, you know, Zach okay, Brown. Zach Brown. <laughs> Zach Brown always yells about that whenever, you know, they, they do something good or something, you know, just like, you know, when Danny Ricardo took fastest lap from Lando in Singapore because it was Danny's last race. But they're like, oh, but this helps Max Verstappen. That's bad that's not legal which you know whether that was the order or not it was and we'll talk about our thoughts on Danny Ricardo when we have our um when we go into you know our, our predictions for Cota next week but it's a whole lot of whatever but unlike a lot of these other teams that we've been talking about Toro Rosso actually had race wins or yes. a race win yes they did by none other then Sebastian Vettel. In our fave. Our fave in 2008, which also, if you think about it, we'll, and we'll do it right after this, but so huge name, drove for Toro Rosso. So this was the 49th Toro Rosso race and then the 799th F1 Grand Prix. So yeah. took them a few seasons, but they got there. But again, just showing you how far out that is compared to like 12 of Ferrari, which is wild to think about. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit ahead of Catherine, but speaking of Sebastian Vettel, big name, like that's not the only one who's driven for Toro, Toro Rosso. And that's not like the full team who this was, Alphatari XYZ. This is just the Toro Rosso years. So you have yeah. Sebastian Vettel, Daniel Ricciardo, Carlos Sainz, Max Verstappen, Pierre Gasly, and Alex Albon. Yeah. And those aren't like, those aren't even close to all of the drivers. Those are just the ones that kind of, no offense to the ones that aren't on this list, but they're the ones who matter because they're the ones whose, you know, careers in Formula One have lasted, you know, to the point of where we are today, where we know who these drivers are. Like yeah. there were actually a lot of drivers who have come through the Toro Rosso era of this team there were just a lot of them that just didn't do very well. One of them of note is Scott Speed, who was an American driver, who was the kind of last American driver to do anything before Logan Sargent came on the grid, give or take a couple records that were held by Andretti. But yeah, there were so many names that, and it really goes to show you like this one specific era of Toro Rosso of the Red Bull junior team really did produce some of the best drivers in the history of the sport. Well, yeah. Cause if you go back like just a few seasons, all six of these guys were on the grid. So like one team produced six drivers that were currently driving, which is yeah. wild to think about. Yeah, exactly. And like the only reason why we're, we're missing one is Seb Vettel retired. 
Exactly. Yeah, it's not like he lost his seat. He retired. Yeah, after so. being one of the most decorated, you know, Red Bull drivers in the history of Red Bull. Exactly. Yeah. Um, also, and- driver of note is Daniel Kvyat, who is one of my <laughs> favorite driver stories, mostly because he lost his seat to Max Verstappen and also lost his girlfriend to Max Verstappen, <laughs> which I talk more about in the uh, Catherine watched every race of the 2016 season. So check that out there for more on on Daniel Kvyat's notorious times. I swear every opportunity you have to bring up that story. You do. It's my favorite. You, you don't miss an opportunity. <laughs> Like, you don't miss an opportunity to bring up the double DNF. I will always uh, bring up the point of um, Daniel Kvyat losing his his job and his family to uh, Max Verstappen. Oh, the going off track lore. Yeah. Only the so, OGs will know all of that. To, to clarify, <laughs> they co-parent uh, little Penelope very well for, for what we know, you know, front-facing media-wise. And, you know, if you if you follow them all on, on Instagram, they all kind of, they're all, all, they're all at the same family parties. <laughs> yes. Um, Okay, so going off of all of that, I think it's also notable that they had one team principal from 2006 to 2019, which was Franz Toss, and he actually just retired because he was the team principal. He was also the Alpha Batari team principal. Alpha Batari team principal, and he did retire after last season. But again, if you listen to episode one, you know this. If you didn't, go back and listen to it. But Ferrari goes through team principles like it is a Pez dispenser. Like they've gone through so many. So in this 13 year period, I'm sure, I don't know off the hand, offhand, Ferrari probably had like four or five, which is insane. Oh, no, I think Ferrari Ferrari. had way more than that from. I was trying to. to (laughs) You're you're very generous. And then there's me. So 2006 to 19, that was after Jean taught ended his tenure, which was 2007. Then we had Stefano Divinicali, who was 2008 to 2015. And then there was a bunch, or 2013. So after Divinicali, there there were there were a handful uh, that I don't, okay. di- didn't have specifically listed. But there, like, like we said in that first episode, 18 principals at Ferrari only lasted one season. Yeah, which is brutal. And Frames yeah. lasted so long. So he was team principal of this like forever team. From yeah. 2006 to 2023. Three, yeah. Which is awesome, so. Yeah, and he was, you know, one of those great beloved personalities in the paddock, and he was really the, like, driving force for AlphaTauri, Toro Rosso, until he decided to, you know, retire. Yep, exactly. And so moving from Toro Rosso, which I'm still really pushing that they go back to, they decided that they were going to promote Red Bull's apparel fashion brand, AlphaTauri. Yep. I have so many issues with this. But well, their, that... their brand just, like, it was very, like, basic. But like, it was some of the blandest men's clothing I've ever seen. Yeah. Why Red Bull has a fashion brand? Couldn't tell you. I mean, they are um, an energy drink company, first and foremost. Well, whatever. <laughs> Um, but they were a team on the grid, which this is also interesting because time is really hard only from 2020 to 2023. And like, when I think about it, it happened so much longer ago, the switch from Toro Rosso to AlphaTauri, but it, they really were only a team for three seasons, four seasons. Four. Yeah. Um, which I always think is like, again, time. But. Yeah, well, I mean, it also does like for for like our concept of it is it's it, not like it's technically a new team since it was just a rebrand from right. Toro Rosso. So like same people, same personalities, just different hat. Exactly, exactly. And something again that is not super common of the teams that we've been talking about, they also had a win. So in the rebrand, they did have a win at the 2020 Italian Grand Prix by Pierre Gasly. How this happened, I still will never know. It this was a like weird race. Such a mystery. I know, but still, it's like, what is an AlphaTauri doing up there? Right. Um, but that was AlphaTauri's eighth Grand Prix and F1's 1,026th Grand Prix. Grand yeah. Prix. Um, yeah. Which is wild. Yeah. Quite, quite, quite a year. And I mean... The the AlphaTauri era wasn't, you know, great. They were they were a really solid 
bottom midfield, you know, if they got lucky type of deal, their best season, they finished P6 in 2021. Uh, they had a decent points haul. They had point, they actually had points finishes in all but three races. So it was a year that they got a decent number of points, but everyone else got a bunch more points. And right. also we know what happened in 2021, you know, the battle between Red Bull and Mercedes and Lewis and Max, but yeah, it was it was a it was a big deal. Not a lot of drivers of note that we don't already know. Um, obviously, Daniel Kvyat was uh, toward the end of his career at AlphaTauri. Nick DeVries lasted half a season before he was replaced by Danny Ricardo, and then Danny Ricardo broke his hand, so Liam Lawson had to come in. So. AlphaTauri really was the Pierre Gasly Yuki Sonoda show until Pierre Gasly left to go to Alpine. I know that makes me so sad. Yeah, the 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 partnership was was one of the you know greatest little bits that we had. But honestly, whenever I think of AlphaTauri, I think of Yuki Sonoda. That's like yeah. my identifier. Yeah, I mean, it was that's where Yuki became known as Yuki, the guy who cursed on the radio all the time. Love him. Yeah. Love, love, love. And then now we are Visa Cash App RB, which is one of the worst team names in F1 history. V Carb. I still personally love JV Red Bull or Red Bull JV team. I'm all for it. Yeah. I don't I don't know why they thought this was a good idea, name wise. But uh, you want to know why? It's because Visa and Cash App decided to give them boatloads of money to be the name sponsors for it. That's why. Yeah. And then, of course, we know that they are currently P6 in the championship, which considering the struggles that the team have gone to produce a competitive car, that's not terrible when you think of the teams that are, you know, kind of hunting them down, which is Williams and Haas and Alpine and Stake. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I thought they would be doing a lot better this season considering they made a we, big deal about like Red Bull's going to be sharing more information with right, the Carb yeah. team. Um, but still, considering that Yugi's pretty much been holding the team together yeah. um, and getting all the points, P6 is not bad. No, it, it, it's really not, you know, all things considered, you know, Yuki's had some really bad races. Danny had some decent races and some not some great races. And of course, we're going to have Liam Lawson back in the car come Kota for the rest of the season. And yes. those are the drivers of note at VCAR. Well, because we'll it's see only how this long... season, because they yeah. only have this season, so. Yeah, which is not done yet. But yeah, we'll see how Liam does not at Kota, you know, considering the caliber of driver that he is. I'm expecting him to, you know, at least be on like up the grid where Yuki is hoping that this is also where, you know, if Yuki is not struggling with the car as they have since the upgrades after the summer break that they've kind of had. Yeah. I'm just curious if they're going to keep it as V carb going forward or if like they'll revisit the naming and branding. Like, I don't know how long the visa cash app deal is, but it's interesting because they were kind of like farming for, new sponsorship like it came out they're not going to continue as Alphatari. they're looking for a new title sponsor um a lot of people thought it was going to be hugo boss hugo boss thank you um, obviously it's not but i think it would be interesting to see where they go like the next direction that they go yeah i think it, it depends on how long they the contracts are for, for Visa and Cash App and if the brand partnership can continues benefiting both teams, obviously like it's it's one thing to, you know, be one of the worst Formula One team names ever, but also you're recognized as one of the worst Formula One teams ever. So Well, I also think you like have delivery both. really helps them out because like you can right. always see Visa Cash App. You can always see like V card team, like you know which car is theirs. It's very recognizable. A brand like Visa is super recognizable. Same with Cash App. So I yeah. think that's really good for like both parties. I just think it's interesting to the like partnership with Red Bull. Like, is that truly going to continue, or is Zach Brown going to be loud enough for them to have to like make some edits to the partnership? I don't have that RB in it. It's, you know it's, what I mean? We've had this since 2006, and I don't think that, you know, 
VCARB status as the Red Bull junior team is going to change. Obviously, you know, with Danny Ricardo being in the car, the, you know, the reminder was like, this is a training team for Red Bull. And that's one of the reasons why they had to part ways with Danny. And so I, I don't think that, you know, Zach Brown's going to complain, but I don't think anything's going to come of it because nothing has come up a, of it so far and they've existed long enough and had this partnership long enough and Haas and Ferrari have a very similar partnership when it comes to you know equipment sharing and and you know man and many parts manufacturing that that's fair I don't think that it's ever going to get to a point where the FIA is going to say Red Bull you have to sell V carb that's fair yeah I will accept your response we'll see Oh, all right. Well, that is our third episode. So part three of our genealogy series. Also, I just want to know how many times I can say genealogy. I know how um, to spell genealogy now. That's that's what's come up with this. I sure do. <laughs> um, that should come as no surprise to anybody. But coming up next, we'll have part four later this week, possibly next week. TBD. TBD. Timing. But we will get into some of the, you know, modern day um front runners let's say so we will have red bull and mercedes and if you're keeping track we did save the best for last we really did i'm so excited Aston martin and alpine will be part five which is our grand finale we did definitely save the best for last if you haven't been able to like follow the theme there's definitely a theme throughout all of these episodes i think this week it's kind of the teams who've changed hands quite a bit but it's truly just like rebranding it's not yeah. really like new ownership things like that so we'll get there um, we will for sure get there um and honestly i'm just so excited to to do part five like we yeah could skip really over part four and just get to part five because that's where everything is but um, definitely stay tuned. If you did listen to part one or part two, catch up on those. Um, not a ton because they are, you know, they all kind of stay in the same family or the same hands, but very, very good. Um, and super interesting, but yeah, that's all we have for part three of our F101 F1 team genealogy series. <laughs> Thanks for going <laughs> off track of this guys. <laughs>